The council will vote on the following finance items. One, Article 11 property tax exemption at the following location. It's on East 116th Street and Councilmember Diane Ayala's district, and it is to preserve 53 units of affordable housing. We'll vote on the following land use items. Park and Elton, it is a, a development in land use chair Rafael Salamanca's district. MEC 125th Street, it's an Article 11 tax exemption uh, which will help with 404 affordable housing units in Councilmember Diana Ayala's district. 550 Madison Avenue, it's a landmark designation of the former AT&T corporate headquarters building in Councilmember Keith Powers' district. We're gonna vote on some sidewalk cafes as well today. Uh, we're gonna vote on the following pieces of legislation. Introduction 480A, sponsored by Councilmember Danny Drum, would require the Department of Youth and Community Development to establish a plan to provide information about resources and services relating to immigration relief and benefits for runaway and homeless youth in programs operated by DYCD. And if Councilmember Drum comes, he can speak on this. Additionally, we're gonna vote on some legislation aimed at finding the best way to help struggling yellow cab drivers. Introduction 1069, sponsored by Councilmember Mark Levine, would require the TLC or another agency or office designated by the mayor to study the problem of medallion owner debt. Medallion debt is of course a real problem for drivers as, we, as we've seen since our last stated, sadly, tragically, another driver, Roy Kim, took his own life. It's a heartbreaking situation. The council is committed to trying to find solutions that will help drivers deal with changes in the industry. We have lost eight drivers to suicide. It is too much. Councilmember Levine couldn't be with us today, but I wanted to thank him for his work uh, on this issue. We'll be voting on two other pieces of legislation, suspending alternate side parking regulations on two dates that are also very important uh, within communities across the city. Introduction 497, sponsored by Councilmember Peter Koo, would amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to suspending alternate side of the street parking regulations for Lunar New Year's Eve. I wanna thank Peter for that. And introduction 370, sponsored by Councilmember Rafael, uh, Rafael Salamanca Jr., would amend the administrative code uh, to suspend alternate side of the street parking on three Kings Day, uh, so I wanna thank him. Next, the council will vote on three pieces of legislation sponsored by council member Joe Borelli that relate to operations and reporting by the FDNY. Introduction 1054 would require the FDNY to make all components of applications for fire alarm plan examinations and inspections available for online submission. Introduction 744 would require the FDNY to report to the council on staffing ratios by division of FDNY emergency medical services, supervising officers to FDNY EMS stations. And finally, introduction 746 to require the FDNY to annually report to the council on potential impacts of fire protection and emergency medical services that resulted from rezonings that took place in the previous year. I wanna invite the chair of our Fire and Emergency Services Committee, Chair Borelli, up to discuss these bills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's very nice to see you, and it's very nice to see all of you guys here. So these three bills uh, are running quite contrary to some things you might have read in the paper and some things you might have read by the Citizens Budget Commission. Uh, it doesn't seem like we're looking to cut fire services. In fact, we're probably looking to enhance them. Um, the first bill, the bill that deals with rezonings, is a direct result of uh, sort of a, a long-term failure to plan uh, for the need for additional resources as we do rezonings, as we add density to different parts of the city. Hudson Yards, probably in your area, yes. one of the best examples. I mean, we're, we're taking an area that was an industrial site uh, and, and basically bringing a city the size of Schenectady uh, every single day in the form of workers uh, and residents. I mean, to give you an idea, Schenectady has four engine companies and two ladder companies just for that population. Uh, we built this without really adding anything. So it is certainly a need. The other bill uh, uh, deals with staffing ratios. Uh, we know that's a problem citywide with there not being enough EMS supervisors uh, and uh, offering uh, ALS and BLS, basic life support and advanced life support uh, in different parts of the city. Uh, we know that this problem gets compounded as private hospital systems uh, end their voluntary, uh, voluntary ambulance tours. Uh, so it's something that we want to keep an eye on. And the last bill uh, is just a pretty simple solution. It's, it's making sure our plans, uh, the, uh, fire alarm plans that, that can be digitally uploaded 
uh, can be accepted by the fire department. There's no reason for folks to have to go to Metro Tech every time they want to file a permit or, or get a permit or amend a permit. So, Speaker, thank you for passing these bills. You guys look great, and thanks so much. Thanks, Joe. I want to call up uh, Councilmember Drum to discuss the bill we're passing today on DYCD. Sure, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In 2010, the council passed and the city enacted local law six legislation that I introduced to improve how the Administration for Children's Services deals with immigrant children in its custody. Specifically, there was concern that young people were aging out of the system before getting the opportunity to apply for immigration relief. Intro 480A's purpose is analogous, but focuses instead on undocumented immigrant runaway and homeless youth being served by the Department of Youth and Community Development and its providers. These youth often find themselves in precarious positions due to their status, and that is only exacerbated uh, when they are without a home or family support. Intro 480A would require DYCD to establish a plan to provide information to runaway homeless youth about resources and services relating to immigration relief and benefits th uh, through programs funded by DYCD. The bill would require DYCD to focus on informing as many youth as possible about the availability of immigration, source, uh, immigration services and resources, including Im Im information in multiple languages, ensuring that information provided to youth is current and accurate, including information about age limits or deadlines, establishing mandatory training for relevant staff, and assisting LGBTQ youth in, culture, in a culturally appropriate manner. Finally, the proposed bill would require DYCD to report annually on its efforts. Today, with this bill, New York City has reaffirmed its commitment to improving how it serves its most vulnerable residents. And as a result of Local Law 6, thousands of youth were helped and uh, prevented from being deported um, because of that legislation. And we're hopeful that this legislation will provide similar results. So I want to thank uh, Legislative Council Paul Senegal and Speaker Johnson and Chairman Chaka and Rose for ensuring that the City Council continues to be a leader in protecting and advocating for our runaway and homeless youth. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks Danny, and happy birthday Thank you. to you and Katie Honan. Uh, the Council will also vote on two items today that I sponsored as Speaker in opposition to the public charge rule that is being considered on the federal level. Resolution 608 would grant the Speaker of the City Council, myself, the authority to submit a comment on behalf of the City Council uh, in opposition to the Trump administration's proposed public charge rule. And in Resolution 609 urges the federal government not to move forward with the rule's adoption. This is a disastrous proposal that would result that the Trump administration is putting forward. We have until December 12th to have our voices heard, and I hope as many people as possible to what day? December 10th. December 10th. Uh, to let our voices heard. I want to thank uh, the press for covering this issue and getting the word about the comment period. Uh, you can tell readers and viewers that if they want to comment, they can go to www.ouramericanstory.us and they'll find instructions and templates on how to craft a unique comment. Finally, the council will vote on a package of legislation aimed at preserving the voting rights of the formerly incarcerated. Uh, folks who were uh, incarcerated and sentenced to probation. Introduction 367, sponsored by Councilmember Salamanca, would require the Department of Probation to distribute written notices on voting rights of people sentenced to probation uh, during the intake process. And introduction 514A, sponsored by Council Member Roy Lansman, will require the Department of Corrections to provide written notice regarding the voting rights of formerly incarcerated people in the state of New York upon release, along with voter registration forms. I want to invite Council Member Lansman up to discuss his bill. Good. <coughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the disenfranchisement of voters is a very serious problem uh, all across the, the country, um, particularly voters of color. And one of the most uh, pernicious uh, means of disenfranchising people is uh, by prohibiting people with criminal records from voting. That um, has created a, a, a lack of knowledge and a, and a misunderstanding about what the voting rights are of people who have been incarcerated. And what this legislation does is requires the Department of Correction to inform people who are leaving 
its custody of their voting rights and to provide them with voting registration forms. Unless you are uh, currently incarcerated uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on a state uh, prison and uh, you, or if you're back and you, um, uh, are you, unless you're currently, if you're currently in, in incarcerated in a state prison, um, you have different voting rights or lack of voting rights than someone who's sitting on Rikers Island awaiting trial. Most of the people who are uh, coming off of Rikers Island or another New York City Department of Correction uh, facility um, have the right to vote. But this mythology has developed where people think that once they're involved in the criminal justice system, they lose their voting rights. So this legislation makes sure that people know that they have the right to vote and that it is in all of our interests that those who are leaving the criminal justice system uh, participate fully in society, exercise the rights that they have, um, and have their voices heard in the political process. Thanks, very important bill, congratulations. And lastly, introduction 1115A, sponsored by Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, would require the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee to develop and distribute guidance for agencies covered by agency-based voter registration laws on voting rights of formerly incarcerated people. Such covered agencies would, be also, would also be required upon request by an applicant currently on parole to check publicly available information to inform that applicant if restoration of their right to vote has been granted. And I'll invite Councilmember Cabrera to come up and discuss this. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for your support of this bill. I'll make it short. I don't want to be redundant to what the speaker uh, just mentioned, uh, but we need to help our, our constituents who found themselves in a difficult time in their lives incarcerated. Now they're out, but they, they don't have the information due to years of years uh, where the messaging, uh, the narrative was one in which they were not allowed to vote. Now we have a grand opportunity, and now we're gonna engage the city agencies to disseminate the right, um, uh, the right information uh, to those who were formerly incarcerated. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks, Fernando. Thank you. And that concludes today's uh, agenda. Happy to take questions first uh, on any of these issues, and then happy to take any off-topic questions. Yes, Jeff. Uh, no, it's only people who are in city jails. We obviously don't have the authority to tell the state uh, Department of Corrections what to do. Um, but you know, almost everyone in, in city jail is, is, a, is a waiting trial, so they certainly have not been convicted of any offense that would uh, prohibit them from being able to, to, to vote once they're, once they're out. Any other on-topic questions? Great, off-topic. Campaigning literally on Rikers Island, or making Rikers Island. closing Rikers Island an issue in my campaign. Visiting Rikers Island and telling the incarcerated people there to vote. Good. Well, um, this is the speaker's press conference, and I know that my colleagues don't want to be caught up in my campaign. I cede this time to you. No, no. <laughs> Good. Um, you know, when when um, if, if you don't mind, just a moment. No, please. Um, I was very honored. I have the same question. Uh, <laughs> Well, you're gonna join me, aren't you? <laughs> I was very honored to be with Kerry Kennedy when we bailed out the first person in the mass bail uh, program, which has been phenomenally successful. I think um, 92 people who were bailed out had court appearances and 90 of them showed up and, and, and made them. Um, I would be very proud if I was able to campaign or otherwise engage with people on Rikers Island and, and their families and their friends to make sure that they knew what their rights are and that they engage themselves in the political process, whether it's for me or anyone else. I firmly believe that every person should have the right to vote and that they should exercise that right. And we in government should do everything we can to facilitate that. You're here, I agree with that. Uh, Gloria? Hi. Yes. Project. Yep. And the city of Peters willing to <clears throat> move forward with that project without going through the full board process. 
which I don't support. So could you talk about that a little and why you support it and what you want to do to support Margaret Chambliss or how are you guys going to We are exploring our options. We're having internal conversations about what those options are, but I share the concerns that Councilmember Chan and Borough President Brewer have outlined on a process of this size and scale and scope and the impact it has on the local community in the Two Bridges neighborhood. This deserves a full public review, just like Amazon deserves a full public review. This is a full public review. And so um, I stand uh, shoulder to shoulder uh, with Council Members Chan and Borough President Brewer, and we are having conversations about um, what is possible, and I'm disappointed that the Department of City Planning and the de Blasio administration, um, for some reason, do not believe that this should go through a public review, um, given the uh, enormity of the project and how it's gonna impact the local community. I am concerned about that, and you know that we always have, I, I guess you can call it a, most of the time a healthy tension and disagreement on when they consider something to be a modification that needs to go through a full ULERP or a minor modification that doesn't need to go through a full ULERP. Um, so, uh, but you know, on a lot of those projects, they're not extraordinarily controversial and we can negotiate that and figure that out with the Department of City Planning. But on an issue like this, on a project that has seen an enormous amount of community opposition and concern, a project that is gigantic and is gonna have, I think, a significant impact on the local community, this is something that should go through a full public review. And I am concerned that if you do this, you set precedent in the future to allow similarly large projects to not go through that. And so um, I'm gonna be having a conversation with Councilmember Chin today about this to figure out how we can be supportive of her. Yes, sir, what's your name? I didn't hear you, sir. Okay, good to see you. Well, the, the most deadly uh, vehicles in New York City are um, trucks and uh, buses and uh, cars. And we need to break the car culture in New York City. And we need to enable cyclists and pedestrians to be able to get around the city in a safe way. Um, I am actually excited about this package of bills. I'm gonna follow it uh, closely as it moves through the legislative process. Uh, and I, I also wanna just say that I have a real sympathy for the delivery, the delivery um, uh, workers uh, who are being hit with tickets while they're just trying to do their job. Not all, but many of them are immigrants and to see their bikes being confiscated and taken away from them and how that affects their daily lives is, I think, not right. And we need to try to fix that. On the scooter issue, you know, there are some legal concerns which we are trying to sort through um, related to the state, um, related to the Department of Motor Vehicles and the sort of registrations of this. But I still think it's important to introduce these bills, to have a hearing on these bills, to hear from the public, to hear from the relevant city agencies. Uh, on what the potential concerns are. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, we wanna make sure trucks and cars and buses are deadly, they kill people, they injure people every single day in New York City. And to stand with family members who have lost loved ones, especially family members who have lost children to crashes involving trucks and cars, they're the real dangers. At the same time, there are concerns from people across New York City about cyclists who don't obey the rules of the road. 
And so I always want to encourage cyclists to use the protected bike lanes that have been installed, to not go the wrong way down the street, to not ride on sidewalks, and to be safe when they cycle as well. But these are not morally or safety equivalent things. One is very deadly, um, one can injure people, but not in the same way as trucks and cars. I don't want to sort of get ahead of ourselves. I think I want to have the hearing and sort of understand the issues surrounding this. Um, so I, I support protected bike lanes. I think some of the first protected bike lanes in Manhattan were in uh, my council district before I was elected to the council. There was the uh, Ninth Avenue bike lane. It was short. It was nine blocks between 14th Street and 23rd Street on Ninth Avenue. It was like the first protected bike lane, I think, in the entire borough. And then we came over to 8th Avenue and did between 14th and 23rd. And then we expanded up 9th Avenue. And we just got, we just got 5th Avenue. And we just got 7th Avenue. So I am grateful to have protected bike lanes uh, because they save lives. Um, and it's nice to have the infrastructure in place so that if we do innovative Full, bless you, Brie. Innovative, forward-thinking uh, things that there's protection in place. Um, so I've always been a proponent. Uh, I shouldn't say that. I was a skeptic of protected bike lanes when I was on the community board. When I learned more about them since that time, I have been a proponent because I know they save lives. Rich. I think it's an interesting idea, and I think, I don't know enough about it, um, but from what I read, uh, you know, this is a issue that disproportionately affects low-income people and communities of color, where people may not have access uh, to credit cards. Um, so anything we can do to sort of level the playing field and make sure that everyone has equal access, I think is a good thing. But this will move to the legislative process and I'll learn more about it. Uh, but it sounds like an interesting proposal to me. I haven't talked to Richie about it one-on-one, um, -on -one, but I'm sure I will. Sure. <laughs> I, mean, I had never really thought of it. I mean, uh, yeah, I think you should be able to to you know, do both, uh, but I also am not someone who has to worry about having access to having a card that I could use to pay for something. Um, so, um, you know, I try to put myself in the other person's shoes um, when we are considering these things. And so, um, it will go through the legislative process, and we'll handle it in a responsible manner. Jeff, oh, sorry, you're next. Stay tuned. We are working on this, and we'll have more to announce soon on it. We're working very hard. We've spent an enormous amount of time since this was announced uh, internally figuring out how to handle this. I have major, major, major concerns on the subsidies, and I don't think there is any defense um, to subverting the public review process on land use. I don't understand why two privately owned, or, or two sites that aren't really related to Amazon were folded in uh, to the general project plan. I have concerns over uh, the state subsidy involved through the Excelsior program. I have concerns over ICAP and REAP, the two uh, non-discretionary subsidies 
that Amazon is taking advantage of. I have concerns over Amazon's labor record. Um, I have many, many concerns about displacement, about gentrification, about the pilot uh, involved here. Uh, more concerns than I can even voice on this. Stay tuned, the council is working on this. I haven't attended, that hasn't been purposeful. It's just mostly been because I've been dealing with other stuff, um, but if it worked, I would be happy to um, attend and voice the concerns I have. But I think you'll see the council do something on Amazon soon. Yes, tell me your name. Van. Yeah, I thought it was Van, good to see um, you. Can you speak to the Amazon? From New York One? Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, this package of bills, 18 bills that are in a package, came out of uh, a really important um, series that the New York Times uh, had published earlier this year. There were a lot of reporters that worked on that package of bills, but um, Kim Barker, I think, was one of the lead people. She similarly did a great um, package uh, story on three quarters houses a couple of years ago. And after she published that piece, the council acted in a legislative manner um, on areas that we hadn't really thought of. So this really came out of investigative reporting. So I'm really grateful to her and to the team at the Times that worked on this. Uh, this package of bills is really to protect tenants. And w we saw many deficiencies uh, through those articles. Um, we saw landlords who were using construction as a means for harassment. Uh, we saw uh, false documents being filed with city agencies. We saw not enough auditing happening of those documents. Um, and uh, we've seen process servers where uh, tenants end up in court uh, not being monitored properly. So we took all of the deficiencies and problems and loopholes that was uncovered in that time series and we saw where we had legal authority. And so as soon as I read that series, um, I texted the staff here and I said, what can we do on this legally? I texted Rob Newman, um, who's right here. Uh, and the, the staff at the council with council members have been working um, on uh, that package of bills um, for the last six months or so, or five months, whenever the series came out. So we're really excited. We're excited that we're gonna protect tenants in New York City. We're excited to close some of these loopholes that have existed. Ultimately though, um, not to in any way minimize the importance of this, we really need major action in Albany. We need, uh, in the legislative session, this upcoming January, to repeal vacancy decontrol, to get rid of the preferential rent loophole, to close the major capital improvement loophole on MCIs, to get rid of the vacancy bonus loophole. We want a real tenants package in Albany, and our package here at the council, plus that potential package of bills at the state level, would have a major effect for tenants in rent-regulated housing, and it would stem the tide in losing additional rent-regulated uh, units across the city. It is much more affordable for the city of New York to preserve the existing units that we have instead of people ending up in homeless shelters or building new developments, which we have to do anyway, but it's a lot more expensive to develop new buildings than it is to preserve the existing units that we have. I don't think anything here is um, outrageous or strange. I think these are common sense uh, regulations and laws that will uh, close some of these loopholes that um, investigative journalism showed was causing significant harm uh, to tenants across New York City. So I don't buy that. Um, I'm proud of these bills. I look forward to them being heard. And I wanna thank Chair Cornegie, the chair of our Housing and Buildings Committee for his leadership on this as well. Anything else? Going once, going twice. Thank you all.